Um, and at, at Park, Dr. Ray, Ray is working on the tobacco related disease research project. And so tonight that's what we're gonna talk about. It connects with our topics of um, environmental justice and equity that we're leading into in our class. We're just moving into that area of, um, of urban ecology. So I'm delighted to have you and, and look forward to, um, to hearing about it. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. As I was telling folks, as, as everyone was getting on the call, I joined Park about 10 months ago. So I've only been working with Cheryl and Co. during COVID times. So you know, I haven't had too many opportunities to talk about the, the great work that we're doing in TRDRP, which is the, the tobacco related uh, disease uh, research project. So I always enjoy the opportunity. So thank you, Michelle, for inviting me to, to talk about my work today. And thanks to your students for letting me kind of come in and like occupy, uh, not occupy, that's not the word, sh have them share their space with me uh, and, and give me this platform so I get to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get my slides called up. Okay. So, Whenever I do a research presentation, whether that's be that is like at a conference or in a classroom setting, I always like to kind of provide the audience with an agenda of the main talking points that I'm going to cover. So when I teach, I like to frame those as learning objectives. So these are kind of like the take home points that all the students that are on the Zoom call today will be able to kind of go home and talk to their family and friends about. So if anyone asks like what type of, of cool CVPR research is going on at LMU, how do they work with the community, et cetera, you'll be able to, to rally off some of, the, some of that background information when you're, uh, when you're conversing with your friends uh, and family. So the first learning objective uh, for the day is I want everyone to be able to describe community-based participatory research and understand why we do it. We do not just being folks at Park, but we, the broader research community. I want you to be able to describe the context that led to the oversaturation of liquor stores, smoke shops, and marijuana dispensaries in South Los Angeles. I want you to be able to introduce uh, to folks what the trifecta is and what the trifecta effect is. And, uh, the readings that I provided ahead of time kind of hint at what the trifecta may be, as do the, the three <laughs> property types that are listed in the learning objective above. And then lastly, I want folks to be able to explain how community organizing can be used as a public health strategy. So what is CBPR? Well, it is community-based participatory research, as I just said, and it actually is central to the work that we do at PARC, which is the Psychology Applied Research Center uh, at LMU, though I think we are in the process of changing our name to the People's Applied Research Center at LMU. Uh, and also, prior to my arrival at LMU, I focused extensively on CBD, CBPR in my dissertation research at the University of Florida. So what CBPR is, it, it embodies a social justice ethos, right? So there's social justice uh, undertones that are framing all the research questions that we're asking and are directing uh, our research as we execute it. CBPR works with the community, not for the community, right? So we're not writing into, uh, into save the day, right? We're, we're working every step of the way with the community members that we're serving through our research, right? And that's from the framing of the questions, the development of the methodologies, um, to the collection of data and the interpretation of the results. When doing CBPR, culture, history and context all matter. And since we're working with humans, groups of humans specifically, we have to be flexible, right? You know, everyone's, <laughs> everyone's so very different. Uh, in, in so many regards, you know, including how we view the world and how we interact with the world. So we have to be flexible in our, in our interactions with uh, the communities that we're working with. And to do that, we utilize a mixed methods approach uh, whereby say, you know, we want to, we have a research question in mind. We want to use some sort of structured interview or excuse me, some sort of structured survey to collect data around that research question. But first, before we do that, we want to 
sit down, interview folks in the community, make sure that the questions that we're asking actually make sense and are culturally relevant prior to then collecting the data and then doing our quantitative analysis. So yeah, we're using mixed methods approaches. And then lastly, CBPR is guided by the wisdom of the community, right? The community definitely knows, knows best. Uh, you know, they're the ones that are living, um, living these experiences. So why do community-based participatory research? Well, <clears throat> it's an indoor into cultural humility and intelligence. And I grabbed this nice quote here from, uh, or I'm more like Dr. Girls shared this quote with me uh, by Trevelyan and Murray Garcia, which says that CBPR is a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and critique, to recognizing power imbalances and developing mutually beneficial partnerships with community, right? So again, it's working with the community, not for the community. Okay, I can't see the top of my, of my slide there. Oh, wait, no, there we go. Something was blocking it there. So before I can start talking about the, uh, the work that we're doing in TRDRP, I gotta provide a little bit of historical and cultural context to the work that we're doing. Uh, so I'll take it back to the beginning of PARC back in the, in the, uh, the 1990s uh, and its intimate relationship with Community Coalition or the Community Coalition of South Los Angeles. Uh, and again, it's a 31 year working relationship um, uh, that Dr. Grills and the team has had with, with folks at the at Community Coalition or COCO for short. Uh, COCO was actually founded uh, by Congresswoman Karen Bass and the two of them, Dr. Grills and, and uh, Congresswoman Bass still collaborate and work on issues and, and uh, submit policy proposals to this very day. And what this ongoing 30 year relationship between um, PARC and Community Coalition uh, has led to is this transition from, uh, for um, researchers like myself who entered the lab from having uh, a, a PhD to what we refer to as a WMD or a, oh, hold on there, there we go, a what, matters degree and we're getting this what matters degree at the community university of south la this, man, this stupid little talking bark keeps getting in the way of, of my talking points here okay um and in this community in this community university of south la we conduct applied action research that is directly informed by community organizing uh, with the goal that our research is then going to subsequently inform policy and that can be public health policy educational policy uh, basically whatever policy needs that will improve the overall uh, situation quality of life of uh, residents in south la you know we we tackle those issues together okay so in addition to historical context the political context also has shaped uh, the overall work to the point to where um, TRDRP has come into existence. And where the political context comes into play uh, really was, again, at the beginning of this partnership between COCO and, uh, and PARC back in the, in the early 1990s. And it was in response to the Reagan and Bush administration's war on drugs, which basically um, instead of honing in on the structural problems uh, that were leading to uh, the crack epidemic that were plaguing communities of color in the United States, like South LA, they instead decided to make the users criminals. And it was in this um, time frame that um, Coco and Park launched their initial uh, CBPR uh, community survey, which is just kind of uh, just surveying the, the, the residents of South LA just to kind of get their take on what really was the core of the issues uh, that were, that were uh, plaguing the community in relation to the war on drugs. And overwhelmingly, and actually somewhat surprisingly to, to some of the individuals on the team that uh, may not have been rooted in the community for, for as long, and specifically members of the research team, it actually wasn't necessarily the crack houses that were identified by the community as uh, the main, um, you know, the main factor in, in causing this problem. But instead, it was the liquor stores, uh, 
which as you'll see throughout the course of my talk, um, are completely oversaturated even to this day in South LA. So inspired by that CDPR community survey, uh, Coco launched their first liquor store campaign to shut down problematic liquor stores uh, in South LA beginning in August, 1991. However, the campaign had to pivot, right? In response to the uh, 1992 uh, South LA uprising in April of 1992, where instead of honing in on shutting down problematic liquor stores, Coco and with Park by their side, went ahead to, uh, and switched focus to uh, a campaign to uh, rebuild South Central LA or South LA without liquor stores and kind of demonstrating the, uh, the organizing muscle of Coco even back in this early phase uh, in, their, in their history, they were able to, to mobilize and get 35,000 petition signatures to, uh, to prevent the, uh, the reopening of liquor stores, which I should say were uh, targeted by, uh, targeted during the uprising, just based on kind of a, a fractious relationship between them and the community, right? They've already been highlighted as this problematic entity. So, you know, and they're also the, um, uh, the focus of a lot of, a lot of rage. So a lot of them were destroyed uh, during the, the April, 1992 uprising. And as, as, uh, as tends to be the case when working with Coco, they were wildly successful with their campaign. Uh, they were able to prevent the rebuilding of 150 liquor stores, which is amazing. And they also led to the conversion of 44 of these liquor stores into community friendly businesses. So we're talking markets as other community assets. And yeah, it helped establish Coco as a powerful community voice and advocate for, for, for uh, promoting health, or excuse me, for health promoting public policy. So in addition to um, this early uh, policy when Coco then basically went on like a hot streak, right? They started not just um, using community, their community organizing uh, powers to really kind of bring about change in public health policy, but they also were able to get a bunch of wins in education policy, including over $150 million relocated to repair South LA schools. Uh, they also focused in on, on drug prevention in, this, in, um, uh, in addition to substance abuse. And they actually have like a whole um, division at COCO now that are focused exclusively on prevention, uh, as well as making sure that they also um, got wins um, for um, foster families uh, in, in the community. Okay, so real quick, I am going to stop with the, um, with the, with the historical context and, and briefly poll the students uh, in the audience here with this question. So go ahead and pop the answer to the question in the chat. Uh, which of these businesses poses the greatest threat to historically marginalized communities of color like South LA? So I'm gonna briefly stop sharing so I can see everyone's responses as they come in. I should, probably should have kept that slide up, right? So then people can know exactly what the, what the question was. So let me reshare and make sure that I can see your guys' comments. There they are. Right, let me go to the question. Here we go. All right, so we talk at liquor stores, smoke shops, dispensaries, all of the above, none of the above. All right, so we're seeing a variety of answers, some Ds, some As, a couple of Bs, lots of Ds. And yeah, like I totally, totally get you right. I just spent like the first, what, oh, 15 minutes or so now just kind of talking about how liquor stores have been a real problematic entity for, for South LA. Uh, and also I totally get B as well. I sent out those articles, which really kind of honed in on smoke shops as being a real problematic entity uh, to the community, specifically in regards to the relationship um, with crime, both property crime and violent crime. But those who put D are indeed correct. It is in actually all the above. And it's actually a little bit more nuanced than that. It's in, in addition to them having their independent effects on health and safety, um, these 
three business types, as you'll see, which I refer to as the trifecta of nuisance businesses, have a combined effect uh, on the community. So thank you all for participating. That was great. All right, so let me kick on. All right, so despite Coco's amazing gains back in the 1990s, you know, preventing those over 140 liquor stores from reopening. Uh, as you can see by this map, there still is an complete overabundance and oversaturation of liquor stores all throughout South LA. So this map's showing uh, both the city of LA as well as communities in the South Bay and in the Gateway City. So it's pretty a pretty stark reminder that uh, that this is still a massive problem, and it's still one that is really at the central, at the focus, excuse, excuse me, of of, uh, of Coco's prevention efforts. That, and then just to throw you guys a comparison, um, here's a map that's kind of showing the um, distribution of grocery stores in South LA, which is a stark like comparison when you're comparing it to the liquor stores. Right, South LA is basically a, a venerable food desert, and while community members can just pop, you know, walk down the street and pop their heads into the liquor store to get, you know, some, some food items if they want to get fresh fruit, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fresh meats, and like they're going to have to get in their cars and, uh, and drive a considerable distance. So the inequity um, is incredibly apparent when, when, uh, when you start pulling out these, uh, these GIS maps. Peter, can you show that other slide really quick again? Thank this you. One? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's liquor stores, grocery stores. It's, cra it's crazy. And this is these, both of these maps came from a, uh, from data from 2006. And we actually just did another GIS uh, mapping of liquor stores, this time also mapping on top of it, smoke shops and dispensaries using data from 2019, which I'll show a little bit later on. And the you know, the problem is still very apparent. Okay. So in addition to liquor stores, which as I was mentioning are, is a primary, still a primary focus uh, to combat them, shut them down for, for Coco. Coco is also starting now to tackle uh, smoke shops and marijuana dispensaries and, and the zoning policies around them. Uh, and this actually came to be based on Coco's organizing efforts with young people, their youth organizing specifically. So they went out, talked with, young, with, the, with, with the young residents in the community, were asking them like, yeah, what do you guys think are the biggest, uh, the biggest issues uh, plaguing the community? They actually did a poll of seven high schools throughout South LA and asked uh, of the liquor store, smoke shops and dispensaries and the proximity of each to your school, which do you identify as being uh, the biggest threat to the health and safety of you and your peers? And overwhelmingly, I think in every single case, the, the, uh, the young people indicated that the smoke shops were indeed the, uh, the most problematic of, the, uh, of these three properties. And like when the team was asking why specifically the smoke shops, the young people kept highlighting these business market practices that the uh, that the, I'm checking the chat right here. Uh, let me get this queued up here. Uh, yeah, so like, yeah, but the young people were highlighting the, the, business, um, uh, the business market practices that these, that these smoke shops are using, right? So they're essentially using like kid-friendly, youth-friendly uh, advertising artwork to try to attract um, business from the, uh, the young folks that are attending school nearby. So again, it's this idea that these smoke shops are, potentially serving as early gateways to, to tobacco use and to eventual, you know, other use. Okay. Move on. And it was that um, poll of the, of the youth in South LA that actually led to uh, the paper that I assigned to the class to, to read um, by Andy Subica, which basically was highlighting that yes, it's the liquor stores that yes, they've been the historical problem, they still are a problem, but now we actually are providing empirical evidence indicating that it's also these smoke shops too that are attracting, um, attracting crime and uh, nuisance behavior. And yeah, it's, this is a good example of how um, community-based participatory research 
uh, again, it was it wouldn't have this paper would not have been published if it wasn't for that um, um, that uh, that youth poll, right? So it's CBPR leading towards academic publication. So we're so we're pushing the um, pushing the discipline forward as well as making policy gains um, uh, for the community. So then taking that um, uh, the research that was done in Andy's paper, um, the team put together and was award put together a proposal and was awarded a $1 million research grant from the state of California's Department of Public Health to hone in on this problem. And to what made this um, made this proposal novel and make in which makes our work novel is how we are now framing uh, our research question, right? So we're not so the, the paper Subica et al was looking at the independent effects of smoke shops, liquor stores, dispensaries on health and safety in, in South LA. But what we're looking at with this TRDRP grant, um, again, this idea was also framed by community organizing, interviewing folks, um, was this fact that it's not just the independent effects, but it's a combined effect. So it's, that the, it's the intersectional effect of dispensaries, smoke shops, and liquor stores that are um, that is actually impacting uh, the community. Mm. So enter the trifecta. I kind of hinted at this when I was going over the learning objectives and probably I think I may have said trifecta one a couple of times during my, uh, during my lecture thus far, but basically the trifecta is just that. It is the trifecta of nuisance businesses that are um, plaguing health and safety in communities of color. And they are comprised of liquor stores, smoke shops, dispensaries, and again, it's this combined effect. And the way that we operationalize um, the trifecta is at its heart is the magnet liquor store. So it's this liquor store that is, again, as the name says, is acting like a magnet. It's drawing in all the other nuisance businesses as well as all the nuisance behavior. And this is because, right, the magnet liquor stores, they've been open for about, 35, 40, 45 years, they have an established customer base, right? You know, they're, they're often the only game in town when it comes to picking up uh, essential food items, uh, most likely what canned and processed foods. Um, but again, yeah, they, they see regular customer traffic. So the idea is, is that smoke shops, dispensaries are co-locating on purpose to pull from that existing customer base. Um, that, the, that the magnet liquor stores have. And basically the idea came by is like, it's, you know, if anyone takes a drive down one of the main drags in South Atlantis, so say you're cruising down Western, you'll see liquor store on the, on the corner, nine times out of 10, smoke shop across the street, dispensary, maybe, a, maybe 500 feet down the road. So it's, it's one of those things that like, you know, previously before I was in, involved in this project, I was hanging out in South LA, I never really thought about it, but like, once I started kind of conceptualizing this idea, you know, around the trifecta, it became as clear as day. And we're also seeing similar um, effects happening, even with, with residents who, you know, basically kind of become numb to this idea that there's co-location of these, uh, of these nuisance businesses. So the trifecta leads to what we refer to as the trifecta effect, uh, which hones in first on the, uh, the Subica et al. paper, that it's the um, combined composite effect of the trifecta uh, is leading to more crime and violence. So there's more nuisance businesses, more opportunities for criminal and violent activity. It's leading to the increased exposure to drugs. Uh, so this is both through the drug advertisements, like with the, the, uh, the young people uh, during the youth survey that, that Coco did for identifying, which is then potentially leading to more drug initiation and use, and then generally is leading to poor health, right? So more nuisance businesses means less space for healthier markets, schools, uh, after-school enrichment activities, et cetera, to open up, and is generally, lead, generally leading to the worst quality of life. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, just to kind of get an updated um, uh, an updated idea of kind of the, the geographical context of the trifecta and uh, its independent um, nuisance businesses in South LA. We're starting to do some more GIS, uh, GIS mapping. So this is what the 
um, situation in terms of magnet liquor store distribution in South LA looks like right now. Uh, and this specifically, unlike with the last map, which was which had um, neighboring communities in the South Bay, the AOA cities, also unincorporated parts of LA County, this is only showing um, liquor stores within the city of LA. So, but yeah, it still paints the same idea, right? The same picture. It's a massive problem, this oversaturation of liquor stores in South LA. And when we then mapped the dispensaries and tobacco shops or smoke shops on top of the liquor stores, we're pretty much seeing this trifecta co-location um, in effect, right? It's, it's the graphical uh, representation of the narrative context that the, the community members have been uplifting. We're, we're seeing it when we, when we map it out uh, based on data that's been collected by uh, our colleague, Jason Douglas, who's on the, the papers that everyone read for today. Just to demonstrate the inequity in the distribution of these uh, trifecta businesses, we also mapped out the distribution of uh, liquor stores and the other uh, trifecta businesses in West LA. So again, this is only honing in on areas in, within the LA city limits. But as you can see, there's markedly fewer liquor stores in West Los Angeles, right? There's 1.9 liquor stores per square mile, and that's versus um, over eight liquor stores per square mile in South LA. The inequity is also apparent when you map the other trifecta businesses on top of the liquor stores where basically, excuse me, we're not seeing, we're seeing a little to no clustering, right? You know, there's one smoke shop that's adjacent to a uh, liquor store there on Pico, but like compare that to what we're seeing in South LA and it's, it's basically night and day. So it's completely highlights the inequities. And again, that's the main reason why you know, we put in and were awarded the TRDRP grant was to, to shed more light on this inequity in, uh, in trifecta distribution. So the way TRDRP is organized conceptually, it's broken down into three aims. The first aim uh, kind of stems from the work that Andy and Jason were doing in the, the two articles that you guys read, uh, which is looking to assess the relationship between trifecta density, community health, safety, violence, and, and crime. And so far with AIM-1, we've actually um, have observed um, significant relationships between a composite um, variable. So remember in the, in the, the Subica et al. paper, um, there was associations between the independent trifecta businesses and property crime and violent crime. In the recent work that the, that the guys have been doing, they're now seeing significant associations association between a composite variable. So this trifecta effect, at least in terms of its uh, relationship with crime, uh, we're, we're providing empirical evidence in support of that. The second aim of TRDRP is set out to understand the effects of business market forces on the spatial distribution of trifecta properties and their corresponding proximity to youth settings. So this uh, aim is, is uh, being led by Dr. Ravoris Moore, who's in the sociology department at LMU. So some of you guys might uh, have, have taken classes with him in the past. And what he's been finding with his work, he hasn't yet focused on that second uh, aspect of, of AIM-2, so honing in on uh, proximity, proximity to, youth, uh, to youth spaces. What he is seeing is when he's looking at longitudinal data about, uh, about business presences and uh, all throughout LA County, he is finding that in South Central, um, there is uh, evidence to indicate that uh, liquor stores and smoke shops specifically are significantly more likely to open up in an area that has one of those two uh, businesses there. So again, it's, it's, it's evidence to, to support this, uh, this, this idea of trifecta clustering. And then lastly is AIM-3, uh, which is what I am in charge of and what I will be focusing the rest of the lecture on. Let me make sure I have 
and of time here. Okay. Uh, and aim three is to examine the effectiveness of a community led policy campaigns influence on LA city and county policy around the trifecta. So it's changing the political consciousness of policymakers around the idea, uh, as well as uplifting community organizing as a viable and worthy public health strategy. So, okay. So what we have done to date uh, around AIM-3, uh, well, first we have been observing COCO's continued efforts to combat the trifecta effect. And I actually snagged a cool video here that Coco put together that kind of shows how that process uh, is um, carried out in 2019 and 2020. I think this is actually 2019, but in, in pre-COVID times. So I'm gonna quickly share that with everybody if my computer lets me No, as I spill the beans on what happened. Okay, man, I'm having problems. Here we go. Ah, thought it was logged in already. Sorry, folks. This is the 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 bane of of presenting in, in COVID times. Okay, yeah. All right, hold on here. So, what this video I'm going to share basically kind of is a demonstration of how. Coco targets individual liquor stores, uh, mobilizes, organizes the community to um, shut down their, uh, their liquor licenses, but also convert them into asset properties. So continuing Coco's mission. So let's Here we go. Well, I lived here since 1970. Okay. And uh, I discovered Community Coalition in, uh, after the riot, mm -hmm. where everything was devastated. And mm -hmm. uh, we, my husband and I, felt like, golly, what can we do? You know, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. you know? And then somebody from Community Coalition came to knock at the door. Mm -hmm. And then we said, oh my goodness, now we, we can do something. We can join other people. Y necesitamos firmas. Que se pueden firmar la licencia de licor. ¿De cuánto tiempo llevan ya ustedes aquí en esta casa? Unos ocho años. ¿Ocho años? Entonces, ¿qué han visto? Pues muchas cosas. ¿Qué es lo peor que han visto? She's actually seen uh, shootings happening like when you're in the She's been here for eight years. And vio alguien que mataron o usted lo vio? She actually heard the shots came out and saw someone lying on on the floor there. So we're, we're literally right by Monarch Liquor Store, Miss Rutledge. We've seen, you know, we just spoke to the lady, people getting shot right here in the corner. Um, you know, just the arrest, the amount of harm and pain that it's been causing for 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, but this one by far in the entrance of the Vermont Quarter, this was called Death Alley, you know, because just the amount of, of shootings and deaths. And you can see like across the street and the other side, there's families, there's children you know, walking by, but there's people still drinking, uh, openly in the space. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very common to see yellow tape in this intersection. Yes. So one of the things that we noticed that when there's a liquor store also, it's a magnet for cops to just harass people. So you'll see a lot more people getting stopped for random reasons. Uh, so one of the things that we noticed was uh, neighbors that live in the area will most likely get stopped. If you look like a suspect, quote unquote, whatever that might be, if you're black or you're Latino involved, you will most likely get stopped by a cop too. Traffic stop and then yeah. they're conducting an investigation right now. So, it's so, to so when we talk also about like harassment, like, you know, in the community, if you know you live by a liquor store, most likely you're, if you're Latino, you're black in South LA.
it's very difficult to live in the community and not be able to walk in your community. But that uh, liquor store is a magnet for anybody and everybody that's looking to to, to drink, cope. To, to cope. The liquor store being the hub, yeah. attracting all these people and making it all available for them mm -hmm. that it shouldn't be there. Our community really needs to have a market, a real market. ¿Qué le gustaría a usted en la en la comunidad qué cosa? En lugar de una licuadora. Oye, una marca, una marca de comida. What would you like to see in that corner instead of a liquor store? Well, if they could make a regular market or something like a little deli. And then you imagine all these parents walking with their children to take them to school and they have to pass through there. But we do know that near a liquor store you'll find uh, dispensaries, you'll find smoke shops. Yeah, right next door to you is a smoke shop too. Right, uh, right now there's no places to hang out. So even, you know, people that have become, that used to hang out in spots, it seems like the only spots that have a light on at night are the liquor stores. And we're hoping that, that this is a moment where we're careful, but we're also like courageous and brave enough to like reclaiming our streets and our spaces and our community and, and really, you know, change the built environment. As some, as a lot of the owners say, well, now I cleaned up, now I, I changed from liquor to market. Um, it doesn't take away. It's only the sign. It's only the sign. You walk in there and it's wall to wall liquor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, there was a fridge with a few, um, with a carrot that they added a yeah, few weeks ago. Yeah. So we, we don't want it to just be a facade or, or you know, lip service. We want it to be a full-on market uh, that we, we're proud of, you know, that we're proud of saying, I'm in South LA and this is the market that I go to. You guys are coming back. Of course. We'll come back and celebrate once <laughs> everything, you know, changes. We'll have a one. Yes, <laughs> yes. South LA has suffered for decades from disinvestment and marginalization. So we're here to urge that you please um, help us and support so that South LA can be revitalized. Thank you. I, I had to walk to my optometrist uh, about four weeks ago uh, and uh, I had to pass by Monarch Liquor Store on my way back and I was harassed and I was um, I was told very disrespectful things and I truly felt threatened. Our children need a better view of their future. We deserve it. Most recently, our recent collaboration with LMU and their research has demonstrated how an irresponsible liquor store will attract smoke shops and illegal dispensaries, which are now both across the street, creating a trifecta effect, increasing the devastation of the community. Like the mother that I spoke to a few days ago, who lost her 17 year old in front of the liquor store with tears in her eyes, begging for us to do something about it. It's also very disrespectful to come and showcase a facelift and say that that'll make up for all the days and days of pain death that has happened. We are in desperate need of access to preventative options that uplift us and not more drugs that destroy our community. All in favor to revoke the license today, please stand up. Parense todos que están. Thank you. It takes time, it takes persistence, but it takes truly really believing and owning each other and believing that the spirit of the community still it still goes on. So it's just the beginning. So thank you, Ms. Rodnick, for <laughs> continuing for being such an inspiration. So I'm very grateful that the community coalition has been working with us in the community to make this enormous change. <laughs> I know that was a long-ish video, but thank you for bearing with me. I feel like um, Coco just phrases it so much better than I than I can. And just to actually 
see their organizers and work and then see like at the hearing where it's a it's a coordinated effort by the organizing team the prevention team the um uh resident leaders to 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 <clears throat> to get policy wins like the revocation of, of monarch liquor license was is, is pretty awesome uh, to behold okay so i know that i am running a little bit short of time so I'm going to quickly try to, to power through here in the next five minutes and try to wrap it up between now and then. So yeah, so the example of Monarch and its transformation from um, magnet liquor store to community asset, right, to actually fulfilling the, the needs of, of that specific uh, neighborhood by offering fresh fruits and vegetables is, is really that. It's the bread and butter of, of, of this project, right? It's 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 a direct it's a, it's basically addressing two of the main um, uh, public health needs of the community. So in addition to the kind of like the small scale uh, wins that Coco were able to achieve through this project, they're also a major player in um, getting the LA County wide flavored tobacco ban uh, enacted. Right, so. While they still have some obstacles um, to ban flavored tobacco in LA City, uh, in unincorporated parts of LA, as well as in a number of other smaller cities, uh, flavored tobacco, including menthol cigarettes, are no longer uh, legal to sell. So they're legal to, to smoke and to own. So it doesn't criminalize the individuals that might be smoking them. It's only illegal to sell them. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skim through this, but this, the, uh, these next couple of slides are kind of honing in on some of the current efforts that we're doing in part as part of AIM-3 at TRDRP. Uh, the main thing being a uh, structured environmental scan of trifecta properties that we have developed in a partnership uh, with COCO, with input from folks and allies at um, LA City District 8, as well as a number of South LA residents. So this is basically collecting empirical evidence uh, that will supplement COCO's policy campaigns uh, around uh, trifecta hotspots, specifically looking in three domains, those being neighborhood environments. So what's going on around the trifecta businesses, a lot of which was highlighted in the video. Uh, compliance and property conditions, which specifically uh, are in breach of city and county ordinances uh, and can lead to uh, or can negatively impact um, uh, public health and safety, as well as the marketing practices and the products that are being sold, kind of honing in on the issues uh, that have been uplifted by, uh, by, by young people in the community. So I'll skip this and go to some of the early findings that we've been seeing with these preliminary scans. We've now been able to pilot it in four different hotspot clusters. And basically what we're seeing um, in our structured scan just echoes what Carlos was bringing up in that, in that county hearing. We're seeing no nearby healthy gathering spaces. So no green spaces, no parks. Um, and basically we're just seeing people hanging out in front of the in front of the nuisance businesses like these trifecta clusters basically are de facto hangout spaces because there's no safe alternatives for folks to gather and specifically we're seeing a lot of unhoused residents as well as young people hanging out so it's basically two of the most vulnerable uh, populations in the community are, are, the, are the are the folks that we're seeing hanging out in front of these spaces and that's just because the businesses aren't regulating the space right they're no they're not asking people to leave they're not you know employing um employing someone to to like a security guard or someone like that to to to, to gently remove people from uh from the premises so people are just they're going to hang out there and plus they, there's no there's nothing else no place else for them to hang uh and and basically because of this uh this this unregulated space residents are then exposed to crime uh and are able to consume alcohol on the premises, which basically is one of a litany of compliance violations that we're also um, uplifting and we're identifying uh, through our community, or excuse me, through our trifecta scans, you know, including what alcohol sales and intoxicated individuals, 
no ID checks at 100% of the liquor stores that we've scanned to date, poor exterior lighting. So if you want to hang out there at night, like, you know, your security is going to be compromised. Uh, as far as the products and marketing uh, practices that we're observing in our, our pilot scans to date, we're pretty much seeing what the, what the young people lifted as being, as being problematic. We're seeing product and ad placement uh, that are right next to products that appeal to children. So in this case um, was at Eddie's liquor store in Westmont, West Athens, where we're, we, we literally captured photographic evidence of like boxes of Smirnoff, like right next to the ice cream chest and chips. So it's a blatant disregard. Um, we're seeing limited to no fresh foods and vegetables, as well as what canned food products that are available are pretty much completely expired. Like this can that was saw that we saw at Eddie's was like, it expired in like November of 2017. So it was like three and a half years old, basically, <laughs> or three and, or three and a half years past its expiration date when we, when we were in there back in February. And in general, we're seeing that all the food product is typically are like relegated to the back of the store. So anybody that wants to go in there to, to buy an essential item, so to say they don't want to make that trek or they don't have the means to make the trek to, a, to one of the local grocery stores and want to pop by the liquor store to, to get some bread or, or milk or something. They have to walk past boxes and shelves just like stocked with beer and liquor. So again, it's gonna expose young people and also serve as a trigger to, to residents who are struggling with alcoholism, which has definitely been uh, a major, a major uh, problem, uh, especially for folks during the pandemic. All right, I'm only gonna have like five minutes for questions, guys, I apologize for that. But real quickly, the short-term goals of, of AIM-3 is basically to have this environmental scan to collect data on 25, 30 properties and basically integrate it with the data that we've collected uh, for AIMS 1 and 2. Um, and on the small scale, look to lead to more success stories like we were seeing at Monarch, right, where we're converting a liquor store to a community asset. As for the long-term goals, yeah, we want to triangulate these aims to bring, up, bring about larger scale policy change and South LA wide changes. So these include zoning restrictions, right? We want to limit the trifecta density in South LA, their proximity to schools, churches, and activity spaces. Specifically, we want to do some work involving zoning laws for um, marijuana dispensaries, just because, right, marijuana dispensaries are now kind of starting to pop up on a very regular basis in the community. And in general, we want to improve neighborhood health. Goal is this work that we're doing is totally novel. And like we think it has great value and we'll be able to inform um, other partnerships looking to make similar changes in their communities across the country. And obviously, yes, thanks again to Michelle for letting me, uh, for inviting me to come talk to you all. And again, thanks, thank you so much to all you students for, uh, for, for sharing the space with me so I could present our cool work. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, this was wonderful. I'm going to open it up. Does anyone have questions for Dr. Ray? Emily. Oh, so. It just sounds like this intersects with a lot of other issues. And like, I mean, you mentioned like food deserts, like over-policing, environmental mm -hmm. racism, all these different yeah. things. And I was just wondering how that like informs what you guys do, or if you try to like just focus on, cause you know, you have to put in a lot of work just to turn one liquor store into like a, a market or like a community space. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, like, yeah, how it all connects and like how that affects what uh, you guys are focusing on. No, oh, definitely. And like our environments, environmental scan to like the trifecta scan tool, like does pick up on some of these items, right? Picks up on, on policing and, <clears throat> and other aspects that are causing like neighborhood disorder. 
it's also like 13 sections long and there's like three subsections so it's like ridiculous it's, it's, it's just like a massive it's one of those things where like we kind of sat down and we like you know we're we're, ta- we're hashing out like which which are the like the most important data points to pick up on you know that would be most impactful to the community and like and I, like we quick we, we instead of like we, we would sit down and be like all right we, we want to remove some of these items right you know um we want to make it shorter make it easier for folks to 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 do and basically we would end up like adding like additional questions to it that are collecting more information around around other other items so like obviously we we, we can't collect information on everything but um, the, the beauty of, again, working with, with COCO and with community organizers is that they always have their finger on the, on the pulse of the community, right? So um, as other issues pop up, you know, whether that be in response to unequal policing, you know, kind of su- su- in supporting, you know, Black Lives Matter, like, the, like COCO's on the ball in terms of knowing what the community needs and mobilizing folks to, to, to meet those needs. Peter, I have a I have a question for you, and it's one of the one of the logistical and economic challenges of trying to transform liquor stores into other forms. And I maybe Coco mm-hmm. has uh, insight, or maybe they've worked with a county or with the with the city to do so. Because one of the one of the fundamental challenges is that liquor one is incredibly profitable. It has an infinite shelf life, right? And and it has um, the advantage if you're uh, if you're selling the stuff to have an addictive component to it. So when you transition to things like fresh vegetables and things that have shorter shelf lives that one have much thinner margins of profit and have have a much higher mm-hmm. turnover rate. Do we know if the like cities or counties give tax benefits or other carrots as opposed to sticks to these uh, liquor stores to transform so that their business models can be robust? Yeah, that. I don't believe that they do, and I think in the one case of of Monarch <clears throat> that 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 was that I specifically highlighted, uh, it was kind of like we don't want to revoke your liquor license. We want you to stay in our community. Uh-huh. Like, like a deal was brokered with the individual property owner, you yeah. know. So like what you're what you're mentioning is is definitely you know a bigger, much bigger picture structural issue that the. Uh, that 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 us as a team that Coco has to you know has to has to because think of the model if you could um, mm-hmm. if you could transform these liquor stores into uh, fresh produce markets or something and do them as cooperatives that are nonprofit mm-hmm. so it would take the tax burden away and things like mm-hmm. that that would then allow these organizations who are of goodwill not all of them are of goodwill of course yeah. but when you just look at the business model of trying to be a small you know, usually fresh fruit and things is managed on a very, very large scale, the scale of bonds or something like that, where you're just dealing with such a large margin that it works. And, uh, you know, there has to be a, an incentive to try and do mm-hmm. this. You know, mm-hmm. we've seen what uh, um, Whole Foods do the 365 markets into markets that wouldn't support uh, a full, um, uh, uh, you know, full blown market, but they could do these smaller 365s. And we've seen this uh, in other cities as being models of, of incentivizing this, you know, the, the stick works well, but the carrot would be good too. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know there, there, there has been some, some growing mumblings about, uh, or rumblings about kind of having community spaces like community gardens, but that really hasn't taken off, uh, in South LA to date. And I think it's just because like, yes, there are some open spaces but like they typically are not owned by the city or by the county they're privately owned so like vacant lots which could be which serve as which could serve as like a perfect um option for opening one of these types of spaces yeah is, is owned by someone who doesn't even live in the community and has no right. interest in, 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 in opening that space up so yeah Well, we're a, a minute over, but if you, if anyone else has maybe one last question. Yeah, and I can we... pop my, I can pop my email in the chat. So if anyone wants to ask me a question or talk or about my talk or ask me about like my, our parks relationship with Coco or generally what the environment is like at park, like feel free to drop me a line. So let me pop that in there. This is great. It really um, intersects with a lot of what we've already talked about and what we're moving into um, in this next area of class. And um, 
It was a really good question, Emily, I think of, of kind of connecting some of, you know, how, how do we connect some of these dots? Um, so thank you so much. And if you are willing to share your slides, I'll post them to the class um, for, Absolutely. for reference. And um, yeah, thanks. Let's give, let's give a big virtual hand <laughs> or a real one. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a, it's not as not as fun without hearing you know the the actual ovation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you guys so much. I, I really Thank enjoyed you. it, and uh, yeah, hopefully hopefully it was informative. Yeah, and we'll look forward to meeting you in in person once we're all back on <laughs> yeah, campus. Yeah, right. That'll be great. <laughs> Welcome you to LMU officially. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care and. Uh...